First of all, I was so excited when Daniel asked me to speak at this event. Um, I cannot say enough about how important it is that the VAs and the PAs of this world. Um, and I, there have been many times in my career when I've thought how much I would love to be a PA. Um, many of my characteristics that you might start to recognise in yourself today make you realise why I, love, I would have loved it. So to be in amongst a room for people that are, I think, really underpin um, business um, is, is so exciting to me. And also, um, you said about the subject of change. I mean, I think when I look at how digital has changed in life and how much you need to keep up with that, and when I um, look at how cultures are changing within organisations um, and how much you, you need to adapt to that, um, I see you as really pivotal in, in that as well. So um, thank you. Thank you, Daniel. And I um, and, uh, hope I do justice to um, the people I'm in the room with today. Um, so business is personal. Um, so as I said, my, my talk is an emotional journey. And I call my book Business is Personal because, and, I, and now my talks, because I've always believed it is. I've always believed that the emotion behind business, the people in business is so critical. Um, but in my own personal journey, um, I discovered that I had forgotten that I was part of that equation. I, I think a lot of us self, we care for others a lot. Uh, we put oxygen on a lot of other people. Um, but I discovered through um, an experience that I wasn't putting enough self-care in. I don't know whether that resonates with anybody in the room. And it's great because there is now a huge conversation around mental health, or what I prefer to call mental fitness. So I'm going to touch on that as well, because I think it's really important. But it also dovetails with the fact that we're wanting to live in a world where we can trust others. And, and that also is about how personal we can be. Um, so on that subject, who am I? So it was really lovely the way Lucy introduced myself. But honestly, if I was sitting where you are and heard somebody introduced like that, I'd think, how nauseating. Because um, there's this sort of this image of people that gets portrayed now, even more so because of social media. And, and I think a lot of the time it looks like people are really driven by their egos. And of course we all need an ego in the world. That's, that's a, a human need. We need to have ego. But there's a balance. And I think sometimes it goes out of balance. And the what I am can really go out of balance with people. Um, you know, so yes, I, you know, I, I've been in tech since I was uh, 19 in 1983, so I'm 55 now. I got married to Thomas, and we have a great marriage. Mother of three children, a daughter of 27, son of 25, another son of 22. I've been an entrepreneur since I founded Academy in 1998, public speaker and author. That, to me, I don't think there's anything really unique in that conversation there about me. You know, a lot of people could say that's what they are. Um, the bit that really interests me about others is who they are. Um, in 2001, when we had blogging on Academy, um, we introduced, I wrote a blog called Emotional Wealth Leads to Financial Wealth. If you're more emotionally wealthy, then I think you have the, the resilience and the personality, potentially, and the brand, potentially, to be more financially successful. Um, so the who I am, I think, is much more interesting for each of us. You know, when you network, well, each of you are going to say, I'm a VA or I'm a VA. You're not, it's not even a diverse room. So it's actually your character, your personality, your values, your vulnerabilities that become more interesting when you connect with people. And I've always believed that. So who I am, I'm unbelievably emotionally open. I mean, I've said before at a, a conference you could ask me any question, and somebody went, when did you last have sex? And I answered him. Um, and, but it wasn't that sort of conference. But I, I, I am very open. I was, um, you know, I, not everybody is. You know, if you did the psychometric uh, profiling on people, not everybody has that open demeanor. But I am emotionally open, massively sensitive. I suppose I could be called an empath, and that comes with a lot of challenges. Um, my values are very much about family and love and health. And um, my family values are very and deeply ingrained in me, which is why, and in Thomas, and in 1998, that's why we created a community to create a business family online that was very much about emotionally connecting people from across the world. And as Lucy said, it was four years before LinkedIn founded. Um, 
I'm very much a supporter of other people's dreams. I, I, when we founded Academy, it was to how do we help the growth of self-employed people, the freelance person, the entrepreneurs that are now going to be so online that they may be disconnected and they may become lonely as a result of that. And loneliness is a massive issue in society. Um, and the loneliness, I did a survey on the loneliness of um, self-employed people, and 88% of people said they were lonely, even though they were massively connected online. They were lonely. And so supporting other people's dreams is a much deeper value for me around what are their dreams and also what are their definitions of success. Um, I'm very vulnerable to uncertainty. Becoming an entrepreneur was the most terrifying thing, and I didn't realize I was going to become that in 1998. Thomas and I met when I was 24. I was in a company. I was sales and marketing director of a company. We were doing 80 million pounds. We were on track to do a management buyout. Everything was very organized, um, very predictable to a certain extent in those days as well. When we met, I had a, a house that I knew when I've had it all paid off. I had two endowment policies. I had a health policy, insurance policy. I even had two school fees policies for children I hadn't even conceived. I put up these massive um, things around me to make me feel secure. Um, and there's a really interesting um, insights now about the psychology of money and how you, you pick up values from your past. And both my parents were Scottish. I don't know whether that says anything. And, um, and money was definitely something that, yes, it is an energy, but it was something I feared, scarcity I feared. So becoming an entrepreneur took me into the most terrifying roller coaster in life um, when I came up with the idea with Thomas of how we could build this community. Um, um, I am so conscientious in a psychometric test, I got 95 out of 100, which is madness. You can do these tests. At the end, I've got some links that you might like to do yourself, on yourself. And that help, understanding that has helped me a lot. So I can't let anyone down, anyone down. <laughs> My first words I said to Thomas this morning was that I had woken up about 45 minutes before Thomas, so I lay really quietly in bed, because in a hotel you can't go anywhere. I didn't want to wake him up. And I solved all world problems, <laughs> or every person that I know, I worked through, and I was literally in my head listing who who could I possibly let down today? Who have I forgotten? What should I do? What? And I literally was working through all my clients, all my children, all my children, three children. I am so conscientious I can't let anyone down. Knowing that about myself has helped me understand how to pace myself and make sure I allow space around very important people and very important things in my life. Um, I have been massively broken as a person, and um, I'm going to talk about that. And that resulted in last year me spending the year in psychotherapy with a psychologist and in group therapy, which was the most beautiful thing that I've, apart from marriage and children and lots of other things, but it was a beautiful experience to go through um, because that self discovery and that self respect and learning to value myself was a phenomenal experience. Um, uh, we've had massive loss and um, and ad adversity in our, in our family, which I'm going to touch on in a minute, um, which um, without doubt defines certain aspects of yourself. Um, trauma that is the Latin word for wound, and I was deeply wounded, but only put plasters on those wounds. I didn't actually go in and heal those wounds until last year. But despite all that, I'm extremely happy as a person and incredibly grateful for the life that I do have. So when you look at that list of what am I or who am I, I would hope the second one would make you more likely to trust me, want to sit with me and have a conversation with me. Would, would I be fair in saying that? <laughs> so one builds credibility and we have to build credibility. There's no doubt about it. We are in a competitive world. And our online brands and our experiences and our qualifications and, my goodness, being in the a PA for over 40 years, what credibility we can show in that way. There's no doubt about it. We have to have an element of that. But the other one builds trust and engagement. And to me, that is so powerful and important and in very, very deep um, value in my life. Um, 
So I'm going to start off by telling you, when I was 19, I wanted to actually be a, um, a physiotherapist. I wanted to work with cerebral palsy children. I'd spent 12, uh, f uh, seven years supporting a neighbour's son after school and holidays who was very, very um, cerebral palsy. Spent time at the weekends and in holidays in a, in a, a unit at Basingstoke Hospital helping cerebral palsy children. But I failed to get in because of my qualifications. So I tripped into the IT industry. And um, I was waiting. I got a job. I got a place the following year to do psychology in London. And that was exciting to me that I was going to then go through that route. And I wanted to become a child psychologist. Um, anyway, I had to get a job. And the job I got through a recruitment agency during that year that I was waiting was in the IT industry in 1983. And it was just starting out. Desktops were just going on the... Um, on the desktop, away from the mainframe computers. I'm sure some of the people who have been in business a long time will remember that time. And um, I was being taught how to do sales. And I was sent away to a sales training course. And I was taught a methodology. And it was really manipulative. Um, you know, how you open and close a sale. And not only that, it was sort of a script. And I, I mean, for me, I could vomit at school if I had to stand up and read a... Uh, or remember a poem or a, a Shakespeare verse. So a script really felt alien to me. Anyway, when I went back to the, the office after this three days training course, um, I had to start doing the telephone calls. And one of the calls was to a guy, um, and you had a target, and you know it was a very fierce environment in those days, and probably still is, telesales. Um, and a guy answered the phone, Roland, who had a, a, a computer dealership in Tolworth, and he had a terrible throat and cold. And I said to him, oh, gosh, Roland, um, you've not spoken to me before. My name's Penny, and I'm ringing from Biotech, and I'm going to try and sell to you. <laughs> That's not what it says on the script. And he said, oh, well, thanks for your honesty. I said, you don't sound very well. And he said, I don't feel very well. And I said, well, can I ring you another day? I put the phone down. I'm so relieved. I ticked the box that I'd made a call. Anyway, at lunchtime, I went out, and there were some tunes, some cough sweets next to the sandwiches. And um, I had thought about Roland, and I picked them up, and I bought them. And I went back to the office, and I said to my supervisor, would I be allowed to use a Franken machine and a jiffy bag? Can I just send this to a guy, a dealer called Roland, of Data Systems Electronics? She looked at me, my supervisor, as I was barking mad. I said, absolutely no way. So I sat back at my desk, and I thought, well, I want to. So I put it in a jiffy bag, paid the secretary for a jiffy bag, paid for the stamp, and sent it to him. So I'm going to complete that story in a minute. But the reason I'm telling you that story is that I was emotionally connected, clearly, from a very um, early stage in business. I then became an accidental entrepreneur, and I wore the badge of being an accidental entrepreneur for many years. It was a safe place for me in the world of business, because after we founded Academy, um, within um, three months, we got an investor, a quarter of a million pound, just offered to us. We weren't even looking for it. And that investor wanted to take us onto the stock market. It was during the dot-com amazing times. Thomas's uh, mine intention wasn't really financial when we set up e Cash Academy initially. It was, you know, wouldn't it be lovely to do this as a, you know, like, like the way Daniel and the com com committee are running the PA forum. It's, we just need to do this community for people. He had different beliefs around it, and suddenly I found myself, as an accidental entrepreneur, being on the front page of newspapers, one of the dot-com th things, uh, and I very much I didn't want that world, actually, but I was in it now, and I had responsibility to the shareholder, and very quickly we had 43 more shareholders, and suddenly the world had changed, but my dream was actually to run this while my children were at nursery school and while I was breastfeeding my youngest, and this was not... So it became a roller coaster. Now, I'm not painting it as a bad thing. The experiences of it were amazing. And over the period of about five years, we suddenly found ourselves in 52 countries, 5,000 events a year, speaking on big platforms. It was unbelievable. But it was a hell of a thing to really absorb into your life when you get taken on those I suppose in a way you know I sometimes have empathy with some people that become these celebrity reality people you know you're not equipped for this uh, you're not mentally equipped for this um, but you try to believe you are so that's a bit about my story um, what I see now is that we are in a period of the need for transparency and the desire for increased trust and when I first started in business, my first boss told me, 
you're far too emotional for business. And my mum used to tell me, you're too sensitive. And I really tried to adapt to that. I mean, I had some ball-breaking female bosses with their big Dallas shoulders and who were nasty bullies. And I thought, I, I can't use you as a role model. That's not the person I want to be. And I discovered in myself I was a servant leader. I wanted to lead in order to serve others. And I sort of was able to find my own identity in that. Where we're so fortunate now is that through fake news and lack of trust and nobody really knowing where to place their trust anymore is that transparency is forcing us all to be a little bit more open, to be a bit more emotional, to be a bit more vulnerable, to be who we are. And that, that is a wonderful time, I think, in life because um, the real people emerge. And when we started Academy, we wanted the good people to rise to the top. We had seen enough of assholes rising, rising to the top. And so we were really behind this, really seeing the people in the academy. It was like psychology, watching the good people rise to the top when they were delivering their brands. So this whole subject of personal brand now is huge. And it's very interesting seeing the way that's taught. We do work with actually with PAs and EAs in companies, large companies, who where they're trying to help their senior execs, the C-suite staff, their, their partners in the businesses, learn how to build their brand. And I'm sure, put your hand up, I'm sure there are many of you that are running social media for people, yeah? Put your hands up if you are. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's an increasing need for, for PAs and VAs to be able to understand how to build brand. Um, but trying to get people to unlock the who they are is a very fascinating thing for people because it's safe on LinkedIn to just say, this is what I am and keep yourself in a closed way on Facebook saying, but this is who I really am. So why is business personal? So the other reason, in addition to that, is how many people in the room are running their own business? Yeah. So what we know is when you run your own business, you sacrifice a huge amount. You, you're very unlikely, really, to be able to see very few months ahead any form of security. You're sacrificing a huge amount in terms of you can't delegate the breadth of skills that you need to do that. And the second business that I founded after Academy, when we, we sold Academy, in, in, um, and that's a whole new story, that's my being broken story in chapter two of my book. So the second book business I started was called Digital Youth Academy, and it was to bring a digital marketing apprenticeship to market. And... Um, the investors I had in there, I was in massive scarcity. Scarcity of identity, because when we lost Academy, we lost our identity. We went into massive personal financial stress and, and scarcity. Um, and therefore, I made the wrong leap into the investors I got in my second business. Um, and the investors said to me one day, after they'd signed the paperwork to invest, Penny, I don't really need to like you. It's just business. It's not personal. And I thought, fuck. <laughs> how? How can I be in business with someone who basically just said they don't like me? That's fine. But I'm in business with them, and that's that say about our values. And I said to her, it's just business, it's not personal. How can it be more personal? You know, this is our passion, our intention, how we're delivering shift, change, how we're going to help thousands of young people who are unemployed. This is personal, and that is the other reason I think business is personal. It's because if you don't have passion and purpose behind what you do as a business, you can't build trust either. And that has to come through. So personal growth within this is really important. And I said that um, I had been broken. And on November the, uh, 30th, 2017, so not that long ago, I had a very scary moment and took myself to hospital thinking I'd had a, a stroke. But actually, I had had a little bit of a mental breakdown that became diagnosed as P PTSD and a form of depression that you can read about called the Curse of the Strong. And it, anybody that's supporting C-suite um, or very senior people or very ambitious entrepreneurs will probably recognize some of the traits in it. You can buy the book on Amazon by Dr. Tim Cantifer from the Priory. It's called The Curse of the Strong. And it's a form of depression that doesn't mean you stay in bed. It's one where you self-abuse, but not where you're cutting yourself. You self-abuse by never giving up. The more you need to do, the more you do, the more you do. And I had obviously done that for years, um, supporting others and, and building business. And Thomas and I, likewise. I mean, Thomas, weirdly enough, last year I broke... Um, emotionally, but Thomas actually got um, cancer last year. So both of us, whether it kept manifested, the stress manifested in, in physical illness or mental illness, it comes out. 
And I saw this beautiful saying by Lao Tzu, who's a philosopher from um, the um, 600 uh, BC, to become whole first allow yourself to be broken. And I loved that, because broken doesn't actually mean I'm going to sit in the corner here and shake, um, or I'm going to be taken away in a straitjacket and get institutionalized. Broken means what are the pieces of my jigsaw, my life jigsaw, that I need to actually take apart a bit, and how do I put them back together and create the picture and the jigsaw that I want? And that's what I did. And that's when I really learned the power of mental fitness over mental health. So we, we are in a world when we're talking about mental health, depression, anxiety, overwhelm, bipolar, loads and loads of things are being talked about. And I read that and thought, isn't it fantastic that you know, Harry and William are doing that? And isn't it fantastic this person's come out saying they've got this illness? And I sat there believing I didn't have any issues when that was happening. Now, what I didn't realize is I wasn't mentally fit enough. In the same way, you sometimes can realize we're not physically fit enough, and we have to take personal responsibility for it. And we might recognize it in people that we work with. I know many of you might be involved in the mental health, um, um, mental first aid practices that are happening inside organizations, and encouraging people to learn how to spot when a colleague is not mentally fit enough. But the thing about mental fitness, in the same way that I might diagnose and ask somebody to support me to find out why I'm not physically fit enough, we need to understand why we're not mentally fit enough. And what, what does that mean is very personal to each of us. Um, so for me, I wasn't mentally fit enough. I wasn't resilient enough because I believed that resilience meant you could punch me as hard as you want and I will not fall down. What I actually learned was resilience was understanding enough about myself where I would avoid the punches like the best boxer in a ring. I could dodge because I had enough self-awareness to know this is not right for me. This is toxic. This person is not right for me. The way they're talking to me is not right for me. The way I'm treating myself is no longer right for me. That to me is mental fitness and resilience. So that's just one of the areas of mental fitness. The other thing is about being connected, and this is why these sort of events are so powerful. I alluded to the fact that loneliness is so strife. Now, loneliness starts inside us. We can d disconnect ourselves for the fear of people really knowing us. And that's something that we have to understand and look at how do we build trust. When I talked about trust earlier, trust starts with yourself. I lost trust in others, but actually I lost trust in myself. I lost the trust in knowing how I could work out who to trust, what to trust. In fact, trust, faith, and hope are so hugely connected. I lost faith. I actually started to reduce my ambitions because I felt protected by saying, I'm not going to try and achieve as much in my life because I feel safer here. Um, who's that amazing lady? Her name's gone for me, that, uh, uh, who got thrown the... Um, Kate, Katie Piper who got the acid attack. She did an amazing speech um, and said that hope was the only thing she found in hospital when she was sitting in that horrendous situation, in massive pain, her whole face had been distorted. And she said hope is so critical in life. She said you can live three weeks without food, three days without water, three minutes without air, but you can't breathe a single second without hope. Hope, trust, and faith are so connected, and we have to always find how do we have a hope. So if we disconnect, if we become lonely, if we don't allow ourselves to come through in the real person that we are and value the real person that we are and stop comparing ourselves with others and despairing that we're not like them, when our uniqueness is what makes us so amazing, then we're going to start struggling in that way and lose our resilience. So self-awareness is so powerful. Now, I did a post actually this morning on LinkedIn about introspection and the danger of too much rumination where, um, rumination where maybe we could go too far into our own heads. And I did that. But I sort of don't mind that. But one of the things that when we run our mastermind program, um, which we run for business owners to help them through a whole 12 months of really em emerging and building the life they truly want, we... We bring in a behavioural, we bring lots of experts in, and one of them is a behavioural psychologist. And what they talk about when we know we need to shift is if, if, if this is the line of normal here, and, and it's like a seesaw, 
and we discover that we're too far this way, what we tend to do is shift over the other way completely. So anything where we discover things about ourselves, we might overdo it, and then we have to come back into the balance. Um, and so often when we start to do self-awareness, we do that. And that's what I did. I became obsessed with understanding myself. Now I've emerged as, hopefully, as balanced as I'm ever going to be in life. But these are things that I think are important. You are who you are. No matter what psychometric test you do, there will be some common traits of yourself. Like, I know I am conscientious. I know that even as a little girl, when I got my homework at 11 for the first time, my first thing I did when I got home from school was do my homework. Projects, I did it the first three days of my school holidays. I am a highly conscientious person. I'm not going to tr change that because that's a benefit to others. But I have to learn how to make it a benefit for myself and manage it well. Um, I also learned that very assertive people terrify me enormously. So whilst that's a character trait that I am um, tend not to be too assertive, what you're hearing today is passion, I'm not assertive, is that I started to think that everybody who was assertive was a bully instead of really appreciating that people are allowed their opinions. Because I found myself on that pivot going the other way. I started to retreat because I couldn't cope with people's assertiveness. Now, some of you will have bosses or clients that are highly assertive. And if that happens, that will trigger something in you that might make you far too passive, feel like a victim. So we have to learn. I had to learn how to cope with more assertive people. So um, that doesn't mean to change. I'm changing my character or my personality. I'm just respecting it as a vulnerability and seeing how I can work within those boundaries. So I can't change, but I can understand more about myself and the triggers that hurt me and affect my performance in life. I need to understand my vulnerabilities. I am now vulnerable. I am vulnerable as a person. I alluded to some of the things that happened in our lives. Not only did we lose our home, get late, um, have massive, massive financial debt, at the same time, my mother had dementia and cancer, so I was putting oxygen on that. My sister, who I'm so close to, we live in the same town, her daughter died very suddenly just after she got married of cancer with an eight weeks diagnosis. My brother died of pancreatic cancer. This is all in a four, four year period, and all of them overlapped with, within six months. And then our amazing daughter, um, three and a half years ago, went skiing and got abducted by three men and, and raped. And all of these things were happening in my life whilst I was still trying to be strong. So I now accept that I have got some vulnerabilities now. I have been through a lot of pain. And I have to therefore understand the pace that I can take, the people I can work with, the jobs I'm willing to take, the audiences I'll stand in front of, because I accept my vulnerabilities and I accept the journey I've been on. Um, I also need to know my boundaries in life. I was once told, I once said to someone, I don't ever get angry. I'm not an angry person. And she said, how dangerous is that? Your limbic system needs to experience emotions to know how to manage them. If you don't experience anger, how do you know how to protect yourself? So I have had to learn when to feel I need to put up a boundary and say, this isn't right. And finally, I learned how to truly be me, truly be standing here, truly being me, not worrying about the fact that some people will dislike me, not like me, find me a bit sickly. Just know that I am Marmite, and that's the only way I can be in my life. So what I really learned, and the strap line that I've put on my book, is how do you lead the life you and business you truly want to lead? You want to lead with total awareness of yourself. And that is very powerful. So if I now go back to that little girl that started her job and was serving a business that was all about money and technology, and I brought this emotional element into it. Well, what happened three days after I posted those tunes to him is he phoned up, the call was put through to me, it was the first time a sales call was put through to me, and he placed a massive order for some computers, printers. And I wrote it down, and I took it to that boss, and I said, could you teach me how to put this in? And she read it, and she read it, and she read it, and she read it. 
how did you get that? And I said, I sent him some tunes. And she said, this is the biggest order we've had in six months. Just be you, Penny. And I was given permission to be my, me very early on in my career. Me was a lot about helping others. The transition I've been through is I can still do that, but also help myself and be strong so that I'm putting that oxygen on myself. So some of the takeaways, which I'm sure um, Daniel can share these slides um, with everyone, so you won't be able to see it. But there's some things that I've alluded to about self-discovery that I think is very powerful. Um, you may know Myers-Briggs and DISC and things like this. So if you're already doing that, then that's fantastic. But for the first one here is I'm-a-power.com. I'm a stands for identify, modify, and adapt. It's very powerful because you identify yourself, but also you learn how to identify others and modify and adapt them. When I said assertive people scared me, I wasn't really truly understanding. It's just their personality. And we all have to get on with lots of different personalities. And the more we can adapt to them with the self-awareness, the more powerful our life will be. The other one is the big five aspects of your personality. These, um, this is a business performance psych psychometric test that's used very widely. Um, and this is the one where I discovered about my conscientiousness and other things about how agreeable I am, how open I am to new ideas, etc. This is very powerful as well. These are all free tests. Um, there are also lots of ways that you can start to really understand what your true values are. Um, I, I do talk about that in my book, but if you, if you Google that, there are ways of learning to understand what your true values are and how to live by them. Because what's very interesting, and I did this in a group therapy setting, is if you write down the main values in life, and then you write down how, what the priority out of 10 is. So say I said family was number 10, and then write down your reality of how you're achieving it, and say you're only achieving five on that value. You then see the gap between the value that you have and the value you're living. Um, and then finally, I would say, just constantly remind yourself never to compare. Don't go online and compare yourself with others. Your personality, your experience, your uniqueness is what makes you so fantastic. And so really, just lead the life you want and be you. That's my big message, and I hope that that's inspired you today. Thank you very much.